Well, thank you all very much. I uh, want to start with a quick survey. How many of you would say you are optimistic about the future of democracy? <laughs> hands, I want to see hands. And I know this is hard, especially today with what's going on in Washington, but how many are pessimistic? Okay. It's a hard question. I will say that on this day, I am so excited to be in this room with you people because I'm an optimist. And I think that we're here because we share this vision of optimism about how we can make government work better. Outside of this place and outside of these walls, there is an incredible amount of cynicism, and it's well-founded because they don't know what's going on inside this room and in your communities. Now, I want to give a little bit of a shout out to Abby and thank you for the nice introduction because after I met he and Jen seven or eight months ago, I have badgered them nonstop about helping states. This time, I will say he's gotten to where if he's walking down the hall and sort of sees me coming, he looks the other way and starts to mutter to himself, I know, I know, states, states, you want me to do more about states. So shout out, congratulations, Code for America for picking the first state. I hope that next year there will be a little bit more from states that can uh, st step up here with me to say it's not just cities where innovation is happening, it's also happening at states all over the country. So I'm here to talk a little bit today about economic development and what you can do through technology to improve that in your state and your community. Um, it's probably not a big surprise to you that when I ran for office, this is something I talked about. It's an easy thing for politicians to talk about, right? How many of your bosses talked about economic development when they ran for office? Show of hands, come on, be real. Oh, is that all, really? It's a, it's a no brainer for a politician. It's one of those things that everybody wants government to work better and smarter for businesses and, and create growth. So my story in the Secretary of State's office started in 2005 in January when I took office. And think back to that day, sort of technologically speaking, what things were like. So Facebook was still kind of a dating site for people on the East Coast in college. Twitter didn't exist. And not everybody was walking around with this phone. That's when I took office. So I walked in on the first day and there was a rudimentary website, as you would expect. It had all the silos and the divisions of the office represented. But in my office, almost everybody of the 400,000 businesses that had to be registered to do business in our state were still filing papers to do that every year and sending in checks. So it turned out that there were more people in the office that were handling paper and processing checks than we had in our IT department. Think about that might be true in some of your governments as well. So I didn't know much about technology at that time, and I would say that my staff thinks I still don't, but nevertheless, when I took over, I knew that technology could be the silver bullet. That thing that could help us deliver better for people and do it smarter and in a more efficient way and it turned out that an awful lot of the challenges that we faced fell into Clay Shirky's sort of, you know, on his grid of problems. A lot of them were the technical, easy problems. But there were also these managerial problems that required lots of coordination with other parts of state government, dealing with legislators on both sides of the aisle to get laws passed, getting a new sense in the institution that technology was a friend and not something that was going to get them thrown out of their jobs. But the results, they were fantastic and quantifiable and very real. It gave customers 24-7 access that they'd never had before. We moved almost 80% of our filings are now done online instead of uh, the very few that we had. It makes it more accurate. It saves money. It's a direct saving for small businesses of $19 million. It's a reduction in paperwork. I can go on and on about all the sense that this makes. But the truth is, all of that was actually politically really, really easy. But because something's politically easy doesn't mean it is without risk. And it is without political or operational risk. And so I want to give you a little bit for folks who, who uh, work for somebody uh, who's an elected official and those who don't, to give you a little bit of a snapshot into a mind of somebody who is a decision maker 
in these situations. So let me do a quick show of hands again. How many people work in an organization where the website has the name of an elected official on the front page or a picture somewhere? OK. And how many of you think your elected, offic your elected official has any idea what happens in the IT department? A couple. And if, do any of them know the words open source? OK, all right, we got a few smart folks in this room. I will tell you, out of what do they talk about, 39,000 people that are in government agencies in leadership positions, most of them don't know any of these words. They don't know about what's going on. You know about what's going on. And that's what is so important that you all are here. And these days, you know, I will tell you that there are mayors like Sly James who still go to every parade and high school football game and have really direct contact with citizens and voters, but more and more, especially at the state level, you can't interact in a personal way like that with voters. And your website and that interface online has become the front door of your office. Which means if things work, that's great, and if they don't, you're a goat. And we see it playing out in Washington, don't we? We know that innovation can do all these fantastic things, but if it turns out that it doesn't work, you're just another politician and another bunch of bureaucrats who are wasting tax money. So I tell this story just to reflect a little bit about the risk-reward <laughs> that elected officials think about when they're thinking about technology. Of course there's a reward and a payoff, but the downside risk of that is very real, and it's a situation that many people don't know very much about. Now, we had some terrific success stories, and there was one I want to tell a little story about uh, that was outside of the economic development area, and it had to do with our state archives. And it turns out when you're dealing with people, uh, you know, old records or people that are dead, you have a lot more leeway to do creative things because you don't have the same security and privacy issues that you do when you're dealing with, with people ordinarily. And so we had this thing called a death records database. Now, this may not sound interesting to you, but it turns out that a lot of people really like to look at death records. A lot of them are genealogists. OK, fair enough. And it's a very popular thing. And I will tell you, when I traveled around the state, there was not a trip that I made where someone didn't say, we love your death records database. It's like, wow, who knew? So let me tell you about this database. We end up in the Secretary of State's office getting about 60,000 death records delivered in boxes to our office every year. Easy enough to get those things online. You could scan them, no big deal. The hard part is indexing those so anybody can find them again. So we'd get all hands on deck. People would come out, they'd help. They'd fill in the seven or eight boxes that we were going to search on. The best year we ever had was 42 days it took us to get all those things done. Our customers were thrilled. Well, one year we decided to have a little experiment. And we decided we were going to crowdsource this work. So what do we do? Our IT guys built a really simple double-blind indexing system where a volunteer would come to the website, they'd see one of these records, they'd fill in the, the seven or eight boxes. The next volunteer would see the same record, fill in the boxes again. If there was a match, it goes into the good stack. If not, a third volunteer looks. If no match, then someone in my office had to take a look at that record. Take a guess at how many days it took to get 60,000 records done with that new system. Come on, somebody. Five, 12, one, three. Good guesses. Three days. We went from 42 days with my staff to three days with volunteers and ended up with better data for it. That's the kind of thing innovative thinking and technology can help us do in government. It's incredibly exciting. And you all are on the front line of doing all of that. So here's what I want to leave with today. I have three asks of you. The first is to please, please, please 
educate and engage your elected official. They don't know this stuff. They're busy doing other things. They want to know. They're in this business because they want to make a difference. They want to do it in a system where they have these constrained budgets and yet they still want to provide good service. And you've got something that they need. So the more you can educate them about what's happening in these kind of conferences and what's happening around the world, the better off we'll all be. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is really just use your creativity and talent in these networks to figure out a way to break through, as we've been talking about this afternoon, these crazy IT procurement models that we live with right now. Figure out ways to share your resources and your best practices. Figure out ways to give it away to your colleagues. Let this procurement be based on things that make sense, not proprietary special built source codes for something that 50 states and thousands of cities all have to do every day. And the third thing I'd say is the next time you hear somebody say something cynical about the dysfunction of government, tell them about this. Tell them about these stories you've heard today. Tell them about the innovation that's happening with people all over the country that aren't waiting for Washington to get it done. That is work that matters. And that's why we should all walk out of here very, very optimistic about our democracy. So thank you all very much.